Thank you very much for that warm welcome. I am delighted to be here with all of you. There's really nothing like being in a room full of holy women. So thank you. Thank you. I, it's my pleasure to be here. I want to tell you a little bit about myself. So I know Sister read my bio. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about how I came to this role. So I have been with the Diocese of Camden for four years now after a long business career. And so back in 2013, I think, is really where I was, you know, you know when you tell Jesus things, you tell Jesus, okay, here's the deal. I'll follow you wherever you want to take me, and I'm going to go. Okay. But on my terms, of course. <laughs> so that was back in 13. And it was a year after my brother had died. So it was a really a pretty remarkable year of pain and journey and healing. So in 2017, through a host of circumstances and decisions that the global company that I worked for, I had a great career. I really did. I had opportunities to do things, to take on different roles, elevated roles, and probably two-thirds of that time, just about, I was in a leadership position, so leading others. And in 18, that company made a decision that the small team that I was on, they no longer had a need for. So any of you who worked in corporate, you know what workforce restructure really means. It means layoff. God bless my mother. She's like, do you have to tell people you were laid off? Couldn't you just tell them you're retired? <laughs> no, Mom, I'm going to tell the truth. It's good. But at the time, I thought, OK, I needed a job. But it wasn't going to be my focus. My focus were the 15 people that reported to me. And what did they need? How would I help them, many of them young, with young families? So my work became in service to them. I would be OK. I would eventually find work. And I really put whatever came next for me into the hands of Jesus. And so I spent months writing letters of recommendation, writing resumes, doing uh, interview prep, and really helping them. And so we knew for six months when those positions would come to an end. They actually came to an end, no kidding, in Holy Week. Literally, Good Friday would be my last day with my company. On Holy Thursday, I accepted this job. And I remember at the time when the job was presented to me, I said to Jesus, I'm like, are you sure? Are you sure this is what I should be doing? And he was clearly sure. So this is really how I have come into this position. I really wasn't sure after a long corporate career what it is I was going to bring to the church. And so in the spirit of what given does, I have brought all of my gifts into the church. And that's really what I have been doing in service to the clergy and to the lady across the Diocese of Camden. So um, all the connections that are made, I met Rachel last summer uh, all the mentors and the volunteers here have met Dr. Joshua Miller uh, as you prepared to come in to the forum. It was really Josh who said to Rachel, you should probably talk to Donna around what she's doing with the clergy in the Diocese of Camden because it's what you're doing with the women here. So we had great conversations. So the fact that I'm here is really super cool. <laughs> so I wanted to, um, just to give you a little bit of a context around how when the Lord leads, if you keep your eyes on him, and you trust him, and you let him lead, you will be where you are supposed to be. So I understand I have to work with this, and I'm supposed to keep it on the Velcro. So I should have my next slide. I think I'm pushing the right button. OK, three times I've pressed it. Oh, there we go. I don't think I did that. <laughs> Pretty sure I didn't do that. Upstairs is doing that. OK, so we're going to talk about personal vocation and what that means. So there's several elements to personal vocation for us to consider. A lot of people think of personal vocation as their state in life. I talk to a lot of young people. They think their personal vocation is the occupation that they've chosen. But for us, personal vocation, literally for everyone, is the universal call to holiness that each of us received in baptism. I love being Catholic because there are so many ways to cooperate with God in order to be holy. There's so much richness. Now, I will caveat that by saying, none of us can become holy on our own. It is literally impossible. We must cooperate with God. It is his work in us. So, and there's so much richness in being a Catholic. 
Carmelite spirituality, Franciscan, Ignatian. There are so many ways that God will make us holy. So in our personal vocation, this call to holiness has to happen. The second piece of it is our state in life. So to, to living the single life, to marriage, to consecrated religious, to being ordained into the clergy. So our state in life plays a role in our personal vocation. And the third element is where is God calling me today? In my work, in my ministry, in my family, with those I'm touching in this particular day. So super cool, he's called all of us together here today to be here. So we're living our personal vocation. So all of us, I'm positive, prayed today. So we prayed, we're asking God to make us holy. At the, current, at the moment, we all have a particular state in life, and we're here. So what is he asking us to do? And those are the elements of personal vocation. It is not just one thing. And living fully into our personal vocations, as St. Catherine of Siena says, it is our way to set the world on fire, is by living our unique personal vocations and helping others to do the same. You are being helped here. We are helping each other. I loved what I heard last night at dinner, and I heard it from the stage. How can I help you? I love that phrase, how can I help you? I think Katie said it too, right, when her mom came in to the delivery room, how can I help? We're gonna help others also find their personal vocations. If you pay even this much attention to the world at large, they, it is a hurting world that is in so much need of understanding this. So helping others find their call. Here's the great thing, right? So if you look at that second bullet under setting the world on fire, God's love for his people in the gift of their calling and his desire for their response to this calling. He desires us to respond to him. Why? Because he put it in us. He's so hoping that we will answer and that we will respond. It is the unique and unrepeatable calling God gives to each person for their own authentic fulfillment. And I will pause there. We're built for joy. We are built for fulfillment. We are created to be fulfilled. He has done that. No human being could have ever came up with this. For their own authentic fulfillment and for service to God and neighbor, it is his constant call to each one of us by name. If you say your own name in your head right this minute and know that it's his voice, every day he calls each one of us by name. This is a super holy ground that we stand upon in thinking about this as it relates to personal vocation. So let's talk about St. Michael the Archangel. Oh, there we go. Okay, that worked. So the key markers of personal vocation. Right? There's some elements to this that when we look for and try and identify, are we living our personal vocation, right? So what is it? It's about ourselves and community. Notice the word and is all capitalized. And it's about ourself and the community in which we live, right? Sister Josephine outlined that beautifully in the talk you heard this morning around the importance of community. And actually, when I read the agenda, because I watched Sister Josephine give a talk on OSB Talks, and I thought, why am I following her? <laughs> Holy mackerel. Holy Moses. But she brought her beautiful gifts to all of us this morning. And it's about herself, her own story, her journey, and the community in which she lives and serves. Critically important. So if you think about looking at, I already talked about how God wants us to be fulfilled. We're designed and created to be fulfilled in our authentic personal fulfillment, we can contribute to the mystical body, right? So that's one of the key markers of personal vocation. Because our personal vocations animate everything else, right? They animate our call to holiness, they animate our state in life. Also, your personal vocation is yours and no one else's. No one has your personal vocation, only you do. I believe they say there's about 9 billion people on the planet. That means there are 9 billion 
personal vocations on the planet, and most of the nine billion don't know it, that they have a personal vocation, that God is calling them, that God wants them to be fulfilled. He wants them to find joy so that they can contribute to others. They don't know it. So he has called every single person by name, and he has endowed them with their own unique design of gifts. So I love the way Sister Josephine even outlined the gifts that you recognize. Certainly our weaknesses too are our gifts that we bring, but every single person is designed uniquely with their own gifts. And it's in the now. So looking at where we are called to in every single given day, it is present reality. Our personal vocation lives in us every single day. So there's a quote here from a Father Herbert Alfonso. The personal vocation is, in fact, the secret of unity and integration at the heart of a whole life. The heart of a whole life. So I brought one prop. This would be Father Alfonso's book. It's called Discovering Your Personal Vocation. It is so rich. Look, it's tiny. It wouldn't take long to read it. This is what I do in the Diocese of Camden when I'm doing personal vocation work is please go read this book. Uh, and I actually do a lot of um, work with the clergy, which I'll talk about in a little bit, but asking them to read this. And I can tell you they're like, I, I don't really need that book. I know what my vocation is, is to the priesthood. You know, but it's finding your uniqueness in the priesthood and why Jesus needed you to be his priest. So thinking about what that is. So I, I highly recommend that you read that little book. And actually, I came to know that book through Dr. Joshua Miller, who the mentors and volunteers know. And I know all of you know him because Rachel talks about Josh's book that he wrote with Luke Burgess. So Unrepeatable is another book that you should also read. You leave here with all manner of book recommendations. So I love giving. So I really came to understand and know giving last year. So when Josh connected me to Rachel, really understanding what the mission of giving was, I'll tell you the world is in need of what giving does. Absolutely, women need what giving is offering to the world. And I'm, I'm so delighted to see how much has come out of the Given Institute in just a few short years. I can't imagine what the Holy Spirit has planned for the years that Given will give the gifts of women to the world. And I love the fact that really emphasizing that every single thing that we have been given has been given by God. Sometimes it's hard when we get caught up in like the things we're good at and I've done this or I built this skill, but to really understand that our loving Father has given us everything, has given us our faith, our hope, our love, our gift, our destiny, and our lives. Everything, freely given because he's such a good Father. So really emphasizing those things and given also this feminine response to God's love, again, you look to the culture and you look at the women that have been told one thing that is not true at all about them. They're literally being lied to about the Father, around what God hopes for them and how he has designed them and how he really desires them to respond to what he has given them. And the, the given's mission, receive the gift that you are because you are a gift to the world. Realize the gifts that you're given and then respond with the gift that you are because you are a gift. Here's the thing that I would say about that even in my own personal experience as I came to realize that I really am a daughter, that I really am a gift to the world. It's one thing to hear that. It's the other thing to evolve and come to know. In my heart, I am his daughter. He uniquely designed me. He gave me this unique set of gifts and that what I bring is for the world. It's for my own personal fulfillment, but I bring myself as a gift. He's sending me forth as a gift to others. And that's why 
our personal vocations are uniquely present in the everyday, everyone that we touch. So when you think personal vocation, yes, it's holiness and it's state in life, but where am I today? Who am I touching? Who am I engaging with? Who am I talking to? That's where these gifts are so present when we become present to the other. I love John Paul II, what he says about women. He says so many amazing things about women. But the one thing is that women see, they see the other with their hearts. They see the other with their hearts, which is really just beautiful. And I think it's so true. And Gibbons' commitment to helping us to see all of that. So what is it like to radiate your light? So this is really about leadership and leading as women in the world. So I have had the great fortune of leading many over a long corporate career. I've led men and women, built teams, hired people, developed people. And I always thought of myself in service to those who directly reported to me. I wanted them to be happy and satisfied in their work. I wanted them, because I knew they would work harder, um, but I wanted them satisfied with their work, right? So I always considered myself someone that needed to look at them holistically. What did they need? What contributed to their lives, to their careers, but also in getting to know them and to understand them as people? So what is it like to be a woman in a leadership role, right? Because we all lead. Every single one of us leads wherever we are. And we'll lead through the unique design of gifts that God has given us. So being who we are out in the world is the way that we will lead. And we will lead as women, as the gifts, as the gifts that we are designed to be by the Father. So the whole idea of understanding ourselves, recognizing what our gifts are, recognizing that we're a gift for the world, what unique gifts we have, even if you went through a list of gifts and you sat with a group of women and they had similar gifts to you, they will be manifest in different ways. Kind of goes back to the nine billion people in the world that God has given a unique set of gifts to. What is it like for them to bring those gifts forward? And you are unique and unrepeatable. And I know it's a phrase that we use here at Given, comes out of Josh and uh, Luke's book. There has never been nor is there currently, nor will there ever be another you. So just sit with that. Even something to take to prayer. There's never been another me. There's never been another you. There isn't one. There won't be. So the gift that I am for myself and for the mystical body, how am I bringing that forward? How does that manifest? And as women, what John Paul II says is we see with the heart that changes people. When we see them with our hearts, it changes people. It goes back to personal vocation, what I said earlier. It's about ourselves and our authentic personal fulfillment and the mystical body. And that's how women, as you move into leadership positions, you're currently in leadership positions. We've heard this. We've heard from the alumna of Given and the testimonies that were given on the stage last night before the awards and the women that are in the OSV uh, competition now. I mean, there's so much that you will bring to the world as you lead and as you heal and as you see with your heart. So the second bullet on this slide says, your entire life is a mission because you are a mission. So I'm going to tell you where I stole this from. I stole it off one of the training webinars that Josh did with the mentor. So this comes from a mentor who was sharing with Josh I believe she was on retreat, and she was talking to a monk. So is Carla here? There you go, Carla. Okay. So I'm watching the recording of that, and I thought, that's so good. I'm going to steal that. Because <laughs> I often refer to, like, having a mission. Everybody has a mission. There's 9 billion missions on the planet. And then this, because you are a mission. So I want to thank you for that. So, Carla, I'm giving you credit here. But I'm taking this back to my diocese and all the work that I do. I will do my best to give you credit in other places. But I'm taking this with me because it struck me really so hard as I was watching. I was like, that's so good. 
So I'm going to try and find Carla when I get here. And I thought, I hadn't seen you yet, so I'm just going to do it from up here. <laughs> so Carla's right here. So thank you. Thank you very much. You're bringing, you bring things to my work now, so I appreciate that very much. So living fully your personal vocation is living your feminine genius. Right? So women acknowledge the person because they see the person with their heart. So there's the quote from JP2. And I just think it speaks to the unique design of women and really the amazingness of the Father that this is how he created us. So if you think about there's a feminine genius, there's also a, you know, there's a masculine genius. Just think about Josh Miller for all the mentors and the volunteers who've gotten a chance to know him, right? Thinking about what he's bringing into the world. He is living his personal vocation, right? We live our personal vocations through the unique design that God has given us. And the whole ability to see with our hearts, to see the other. So I want to go transition now a little bit to story. So our stories are so important to us. So listening, even thinking, reflecting back on the stories that Sister Josephine told us about herself in the first um, presentation this morning. That is how we get to know each other. Our stories create that intimate connection with each other. So even just thinking for a moment of your closest, closest friends, your inner circle, maybe it's a spouse, maybe it's somebody in particular in your community. You have a best friend for a long time. So what you're willing to share with the other person matters a great deal. So stories, so even, even this I would give you an example. So there's a mentor here too. She is my sacred sister, she is my very good friend, she's also the strategic partner to my office. So Kara Stolarczyk is over there, raise your hand Kara. Kara knows an awful lot about me. Kara knows we used to work together back at the company. We didn't even know each other very well back then. We really, we reported to the same director. We did work, but in very different areas. So we didn't know each other. We didn't come to be friends until after Kara had left and committed herself to the work of the kingdom. And so I connected with her after she had left. We really cultivated this great friendship, uh, shared stories, you know, and that's how, our, that's how our friendship and connection was built is by sharing. She knows an awful lot about me, so no asking her at lunch, no asking. You know, but really like sharing like the, the things to be celebrated in life, the things that scare you, the sad things. So this is what creates connection for us, are our stories. And really it's our stories and our actions in them, the actions that we take that animate our lives. And God, Abba, I love to call him Abba, really has placed this in us. He's the architect of literally the blueprint of our lives. So the kinds of actions we take, the things that we do that we love, right? So when you're in your present moment, you're in your groove, you're kind of in that place of what Kara often refers to as the juicy juice, right? It's you're in it. Those things have been planted in us by the Father, and it's those actions, and he has given us this blueprint. And again, I'm gonna quote from Josh's book because it's so powerful. Every vocation is a call to love in a unique and unrepeatable way. Nine billion opportunities to love in a unique and unrepeatable way. Cultivating the vocation of a person then is about helping her to fully and authentically embrace the way that she is called to love. Her personal way of receiving, receiving and giving love, of uniting herself with Christ and of surrendering herself to grace. In becoming who she is, she becomes capable of loving God and neighbor with every fiber of her being. Thank God Sister Josephine said that it was a work in progress. We were on the path to love God and neighbor with every fiber of our being. And that's what he wants for us. This is everything that he wants for us. So now I'm going to talk to you about a different kind of story. I didn't even have to touch the button yet. Someone's watching me reach for the remote and move the slide. <laughs> so it's cool. 
All right, I want to talk to you about a particular kind of story this morning that matters a great deal, and they're called fulfillment stories. And they're the kind of stories that we tell about ourselves that actually show us and give us an opportunity to celebrate our why, our why. So back to Kara's juicy juice, right? That's the why. So what are fulfillment stories? These are activities that we have done, that we have taken on at any time in our lives. So you can go all the way back to when you were a kid. You thoroughly enjoyed doing it. You know that you did it well. This has nothing to do with pride. You know you did it well, and it gave you a deep sense of satisfaction. So in this story, there's nothing passive in a fulfillment story. You are the protagonist. You are the doer. So you have done something. That's a fulfillment story. And those are the things that we're going to talk about this morning and kind of look for across our lives is find those fulfillment stories. So what are the elements of a fulfillment story? If you were building one, if you were going to write one down, they get sort of a summary statement or a title, something that describes this fulfillment story as you were to tell another person. You'd want to answer the question, what prompted me to get involved or to do the thing that I did? What was the prompt? What was the nudge? What were the actions? that I took? What did I do? Remember, not passive, like how I went through this thing and that was good. No, I did something. And I loved doing it. I know I did it well. And it gave me a deep sense of satisfaction. And to be able to identify what was most satisfying in it. So if you think about that, and you have time in a minute, you're going to come up with one. The mentors have all uh, gone through this in the last couple of weeks to understand what their fulfillment stories are. So for those of you that are coming into Given for this year to be assigned a mentor, this will be your first opportunity to kind of think through what, are, what is my fulfillment story or what are my stories? And the one thing that I want to say about that is we all walk different paths. And sometimes you think, I don't, I don't have one. I don't have a fulfillment story. I can't find this. This is a really great opportunity to pray in front of the Blessed Sacrament, if this is a struggle, is to find a fulfillment story. We all live different, different lives. We all have different experiences. We all have different wounds and different things that, that maybe are blocking our ability to see and to find our own fulfillment story. So it's a really good opportunity for prayer. But imagine what it's like to know your fulfillment stories and to share them with someone else. Right? We talk about the ability to create connection and create community and to give to the mystical body. So you share your story. Imagine what it's like to try and get a fulfillment story out of someone else, get out of them, that sounds terrible. You're trying to call from them so they realize these things that they've done, that they've done well, and that they have derived great satisfaction from. Because in the fulfillment story is the handiwork of God. His handiwork is in your fulfillment story. He is likely the prompt. He created you to take that action. He placed in you to having loved doing it. So all of this, God is fully present in your fulfillment stories. So I want to tell you a little bit uh, about some work that I'm doing in the Diocese of Camden. So we're doing some leadership development with the clergy. So I have this Office of Discipleship and Leadership. So helping parishes, you know, make disciples, but also leadership development for the clergy and for the laity. So a little story about that is what could we do for the clergy that would benefit them? So I look at your action plans, right? And who is it that you want to serve? And so for me, I wanted to serve the clergy. Uh, I think their, their work is monumental. Uh, I think you look at the the shrinking numbers of clergy. I think their work is, is challenging. But I also think they spend a lot of time like in their role as priests and not in unique children of God themselves. So, and Kara's very instrumental, and so is Josh Miller, in terms of what we're bringing to the Diocese of Camden now. And there's lots of good ways to do leadership development. 
But as I talked to the priests of the diocese and asked them this particular question, clearly you're called by Jesus to be a priest and you've given your yes. Do you know why Jesus needs you to be his priest? He needs you, but do you know the reason why? Every one of them said no. They know they're to be a priest. They know it in their bones, in every fiber of their being. But they don't know why. So that was really an impetus, is to begin leadership development for the clergy in the Diocese of Camden, starting with them. Them as children of God, them as sons of God, to identify their unique and unreputable selves. For them to see their design that God gave them so that they, they could minister no matter where they were called to minister, that they could do it happy, healthy, just be who they were supposed to be as a priest. So last year we put the first group of priests through and we called it a pilot and they knew it. So they were willing to come along on a pilot to help us test it. And part of it was for them to identify their fulfillment stories. I can tell you they struggled a little bit in the fulfillment story space. I got a few phone calls. Donna, what am I doing with this fulfillment story thing? <laughs> okay, Father, right? So what I will tell you, so it's, it was a four to five month process. They were given executive coaches. Josh Miller is one of the coaches to the clergy. Um, and so it's really accompaniment. It's really someone like a Josh Miller to accompany the priest and to really sort of peel back the onion and reveal their unique and unrepeatable selves to themselves and to understand God's unique design of them. And that's why Jesus needed them specifically to be his priest. So what we did, so we, we put uh, a number of clergy through this process last year. And what I will tell you is we have our group just finishing up this is year. So we called them a pilot. This year we're calling it cohort two because they loved it. And most of the priests that are in it this year came forward and raised their hand to be in it for this year because they heard from their brother priests. I will tell you when we launched it uh, last year, the first group was like, yeah, okay, sure. I know I'm in a pilot. Not really understanding what it was, but really they were the greatest advocate. And so for the next cohort, which is cohort three now, we already have priests raising their hands. So the plan is to put the entire pres the active presbyterate through this to understand who we are uniquely created by God. So the reason I tell you all of that is to circle back around to fulfillment stories. So we didn't give them an example, the first group. We didn't give an example of fulfillment. We gave them the criteria that I just walked you through on the previous slide. This year, we're like, OK, we need to tell them one, right? So I'm going to tell you my favorite fulfillment story. So can I go just one click if you're doing it from upstairs? Thank you. So this is me. Um, I would be the one in the uh, fancy dress with a white purse. <laughs> so this is probably circa 67 or 68. And I'm with my mom and dad and my brother. But who I'm with are my grandparents. And this is who I want to tell you about. So this is my fulfillment story. So probably just a f within a few years of this picture. So I am their first grandchild. So I have little hearts over their heads, right? My grandmother and my grandfather. I'm their first grandchild. They lived in upstate Pennsylvania, coal country. And so probably by the time I was seven, I was allowed to go and spend my summers with my grandparents. I totally loved and was in love with my grandparents. And honestly, I can say that they were in love with me too. And I just had this amazing relationship with them. So my grandfather had been a coal miner. So by the time I'm doing this, hanging out with them in the summer, you know, he's had black lungs. So he's, he, doesn't do, he doesn't do a lot because he can't get enough oxygen. But they were lovely country people that lived in this place called Minersville, Pennsylvania. And I would spend all summer. I couldn't wait till the end of the school year because my parents were taking me up there. Right? I was going to get to spend it with Grammy Gramps all summer. I learned how to swim at the community pool. My grandfather would take me over there. He would go down that slide. Amazingly, he would go down the slide with me until I could do it by myself. 
You know, he was my fishing buddy. You know, we didn't fish up there. When I was younger, we used to fish at the shore, but he was my fishing buddy. He taught me how to pick mushrooms, how to not to pick the poisonous ones so we all wouldn't die when we cooked them. <laughs> he taught me how to pick blueberries, and then I would go home and make homemade blueberry pie with her. You know, she'd pack my lunch to go to the pool with him, and I got Hawaiian punch in like mason jars. And it was just this, just this wonderful relationship that I had with these two people that I was totally in love with. So within a couple years of starting to do that, see, and my other cousins they didn't get to come because most of them are boys, yeah. right? So they, they got to come later. And they were only allowed to come for short periods of time. I got to spend the whole summer up there. So the other thing that I will tell you is I give my grandparents, and they're long, they're long dead now, um, I give them credit for the fact that I don't have a whole lot of a self-esteem problem because of them. Right? They just built, the, through their love, they built confidence in me. Right? And my mom is okay that I talk about it that way. It's not that she didn't help too. Not that she and my dad. My dad died when I was little. So, you know, he died when I was 10. But she's okay that I give credit to them for that, that gifting. Right? So, within a few years of when I started to go up there, what I would do is, because I was leaving, I had to go back to Philadelphia to go to school. So my parents would come up at the end of the summer and get me and bring me home because I had to go to school. And really, how many times was I going to see them until the next June? Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter, maybe a couple of other, I wasn't gonna see them very much over a longer period of time. So I was gonna go from every single day to not very much over, over many months. So here's what I started to do. As I would get to the end of the summer before I went home, I would write my grandparents love letters and I would hide them all over their house. So their house was heated with coal. I hid my love letters in the coal bin. They canned. I hid my love letters like way back in the cans, right, that they wouldn't get to until winter. Like I tried to time it so they would find them all year long. My grandfather made wine, so I hid them in and under the wine bottles. So I don't know how many people will remember this. My grandmother had one of those Jean Nate talcum powder puffs, right? <laughs> Okay, anybody else remember those? I don't even know if they still exist, right? I hid them way under the talcum, right? I said little notes. They called me every time they found a note. Every single time. Oops. <laughs> so. I'm good. Give me a minute. <laughs> okay, we can go to the next slide. <laughs> the next part of that slide. So these are the elements of the fulfillment story. So I've told you the details of my story. So what is this summer? What's the title? This is my summer love letter series. That's what I call it. And I will tell you, I have not told this story to anyone up until about three years ago. Of course, meeting Josh Miller and understanding how I'd uncover these. I never told anybody. Who knew about them? My grandparents knew about it and my parents knew about it. Okay, now all of you know it. So do so many people across my diocese, you know, when I talk and share. What prompted me to do what I did? I wanted to love deeply my favorite people with random acts of surprising joy. They lived simple lives. They lived in the country, and I was like, what can I do for them? They've given me like this awesome summer, you know, every year. And I did it for years. You know, I know we hear the stories while we're here around, you know, exploring vocation. Okay, when I was 10, I did a, a book report on St. Therese of Lisieux, and I fell madly in love with her, and I thought, I'm going to be a Carmelite. That lasted about four years. When I was 14, I discovered boys and cigarettes, and that was the end of monastery for me. <laughs> I finally quit smoking, and I'm called to marriage. <laughs> but this is, what, this is what prompted me to do this for them. It's because I love them, and I wanted to surprise them, and I wanted them to know, right? So what did I do? I'm the doer. I'm the protagonist of my fulfillment story. I wrote love notes, and I hid them. I hid them all over their house that they would find. And what was the, the deepest part of this is what is deeply satisfying? that I was madly in love with them. My gift, to, I'm a kid, I can't give them anything. I don't have any money. There's nothing I can give my grandparents. 
people my love and to show them how important they are to me, right? So that they would know they held this unique place in my heart because I knew theirs. Why is this happening to me? <laughs> so, my core motivations for these things that are gifts from God. Oh, thank you, I'm getting tissues. <laughs> thank you, sister. My husband will tell you when I try and cry and my makeup is done, I do this. <laughs> so I don't mess up my makeup. It doesn't work near as well now that I wear glasses. <laughs> but my three core motivations that God gave me is to be central, you'll see them here at the bottom of the slide, to be central, to have an impact, and to serve. So those are my drivers. Those are the things that animate my life, are those three things. And so how do I find more of it, right? How do I step into this? How do I use these that God gave me? How do I find these? So if you look across my love, my summer love letter series that I did for years for them, this is what drives me. God gave that to me, right? So I'm faking like I'm pushing the remote. OK, there we go. So I want to share with you around M code, because that's the, that's the part of the title of this talk this morning for you. M code is an assessment. So all the mentors have just been through this. All the mentors know what their core motivations are. And for all of you here, I just, want, I just want all the young women to know you're getting that gift from given to. It's coming to you too. So I know that's the last bullet on this slide, but I thought you won't hear me talk about anything else unless you know you're getting it too, right? So what does the M code assessment do, right? It reveals unique patterns of God's given motivation and gift to each of us. Like there's a part of me, like be central, have an impact and serve, like maybe if some, like maybe I'd kind of know that about myself, but they're not words I would use. I have words now for what moves me. I can talk about that and it's okay. I will tell you, like for anybody that has be central, I was like, there's nothing very humble about that. And I remember talking to Josh at the time, three years ago when I did my M code, I'm like, Josh, man, there's something wrong with this. He was like, oh, I so, so have to talk to you. You know, but it isn't. It's around being in the middle of things that are happening. And being, do you not think I wanted to be central? And he used my own fulfillment story right back to me. He says, did you not want to be in the middle of your grandparents' life? I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, good. <laughs> so then I felt better, right? Because at first I was like, Josh, be central. That's not, there's no humility in that, right? But this is all God-given, right? He gives us everything because he's such a good and loving father. So this helps us to recognize things in ourselves. And here's the thing around the assessment, and this comes directly from the assessment, right? Which drives our engagement, our satisfaction, and fulfillment in all the aspects of our life. So I am not just be central, have an impact, and serve, in certain places. That's me all the time. In the work I do for the diocese, right? As I came here today, in my marriage to my husband, for the care of my mother, everything I do, in the service to the clergy of the Diocese of Camden, that's me. And I bring me. I also know he created me to be a little bold too, so I've comfortably stepped into that, right? Core motivations, I love this too. They're unique, right? They're in eight. Enduring behavioral drives that orient to achieve a distinct pattern of result. So for all of you that have action plans that are in your future for the next year, your, code of, your core motivations will be woven through all of it. It's how you will move through to get to drive towards the results of your action plan. They are enduring, irresistible, insatiable, and explanatory. Every bit of that is true. Having done it, having done three years ago, and really kind of prayed about my core motivations, what do you want me to do with these, you know, like all of that, every bit of that is true. They're enduring. They don't change. I've always been this way. 
right? I can find fulfillment stories from the last year that all those elements are contained within them. And so, as I said, you're going to get an opportunity to do your own M code assessment and see what's in there for you. So this is where you're gonna take an opportunity. So for the, okay, next slide, thank you. So for the mentors, so we're gonna do a little bit of an exercise now. So for the mentors, you're gonna pick one of your fulfillment stories that you use. And for the next few minutes, all the mentors and volunteers, because the volunteers did the assessment too, I believe, you're going to pray for all the young women that are here who will eventually take the M code assessment. For all the young women that are here, pray and think about a fulfillment story in your life. And what I said before holds true. If you struggle to find one, it's totally okay. You wanna pray about that. But you wanna take some quiet time now and capture a fulfillment story that you'd be willing to share with another person. And why do I say that? Because that's what we're gonna do. Because we're all about building connection and intimacy with each other, right? So you'll capture it this way. The elements are there, right? What's the title or a short summary statement of what you did, right? It's my summer love letter series. What prompted you to get involved? What actions did you take? And what did you find deeply satisfying about the fulfillment story? So what I would like to do, so we have microphones that are being run up and down the side aisles. So what I wonder, for those of you that listened, so you all listened, right? You shared your fulfillment stories. Let's go with this question first. What was it like to hear someone's fulfillment story? What was it like to hear one? Don't be shy. Um, I know when I was listening to Sister's Fulfillment Story, um, what really struck me was just seeing how she would glow, like talking mm -hmm. about um, her experience that um, really fulfilled her, right? Um, seeing how animated she got, seeing just how full of life that she, she was. Um, so that's what really struck me about being able to hear about this fulfillment story. Thank you for sharing that. And Sister, do you want to tell us what your story was? We should um, all see that joy. How much time do I have? <laughs> <laughs> Two minutes. Okay, I'll try to be brief. Just kidding. Um, so what I was sharing with Emily was that, so this was last year, so I'm serving as campus minister at our high school in Miami. And so this was the first time in Miami that the Respect Life Office wanted to host a uh, fundraiser, a pro-life fundraiser with all the schools. And so, um, they reached out to all the principals asking um, to assign a coordinator to coordinate the fundraiser. So as soon as my principal, Sister Margaret Ann, even mentioned the idea, I said, Sister, I would love to. So um, we had baby bottles to send home with all the students. And just a little point that we are the smallest school in, our, in the Diocese of Miami, the smallest Catholic school. So... Um, I met with the theology teachers and with the business office to try to like, how are we going to incentivize, you know, how are we going to make this so that the students really want to participate. So what we came up with was to have a class competition. So the class that brought in the most donations uh, would win a class party in the gym. And so what I did, just to make it very visual, is I put, made a big bulletin board in the theology wing and I put like huge baby bottles color coded um, by the class. And so as the don donations came in, we would, you know, post it there um, so that they could see. And we would make announcements and things like that. And so really soon, the different classes, different representatives from the classes started approaching me with, well, sister, can we do this fundraiser and this fundraiser to go towards our fund? And I said, this is a great idea, yes. So, um, for example, the, the seniors started selling wristbands and like pro-life buttons during lunch, like $3 a button, and they would go around table to table, um, and that would all go towards their fund. The sophomores hosted a bake sale, and all the funds went um, to their fund. The um, juniors, so Catholic school, they wear uniforms, right? So anyone, anytime they have an opportunity to dress down, uh, they, that made, that was, I think, the most successful fundraiser. <laughs> the, um, 
they did a onesie dress down, so like pajama onesie dress down, and basically the whole school participated in that. Um, let's see, the, uh, the baseball team said, sister, can we host a home run derby? And I said, yes! So it was just awesome, all these different groups coming up with ideas. And um, even like the faculty and staff, we had a um, uh, door decorating competition. And so the different clubs and moderators and sponsors were decorating. So even walking down the hallways, you're seeing just all these pro-life messages and so much education around um, just different fetal facts and just different things that probably the students weren't aware of before. So it was so educational and just everyone was getting involved. Um, so by the end of the month, we raised $7,770.77. <laughs> and I'm, I'm a math major, so I really appreciate numbers, and seven's the number of perfection. So I really, it was the Lord blessing our work. And we actually ended up winning the, the competition, um, diocesan-wide, and they were so impressed, like, we're the smallest school. How did you raise the most amount of money? And so really, it was just... To me, what was most satisfying was that everyone was getting involved and we were making an impact, that this money wasn't for us, it was to help women in crisis pregnancies. And so that just brought me so much joy and fulfillment to see everyone getting involved and on board and sharing the mission. So thank you, thank sister. You. So. You can hear pure joy in Sister's voice as she tells the story. And for those of you that are sitting, sitting behind Sister and can't see her face, it totally radiates joy while she talks about it. See, and that's what Fulfillment Story does. We get to talk about these things that we did that give us a deep sense of satisfaction. Who else would like to share what it was like to hear someone's Fulfillment Story? We have one here, and then we'll go over here. Someone has their hand up over here. Okay. Hello. Hello. Uh, okay, so I thought it was um, just beautiful. I also fe felt and heard the joy and um, saw the joy, um, passion. But I also loved seeing the sincerity, the genuineness of her and how her mind works. And... Um, kind of like the blooming process I'm seeing her discover herself. You know, um, I think we're just all like learning right now, like, you know, the beginning of our, um, our journey and just to see the like instigating, you know, fire build up is awesome. So that's what I noticed. Yeah. Thank you very much for sharing that. I appreciate it. See? There's holy fire in our fulfillment stories. Okay, over here. Hi. So I was listening. Um, something that Jennifer was sharing was her joy of getting giving presents and talking about her mom. And I was just getting so excited um, because one of the things that came into my heart is like, I suck at gift giving. Like, that's so not me, but it's so beautiful to see that come alive in her, and it um, gave me such an appreciation for how necessary it is for us to be unique and unrepeatable, and how, um, how much we need each other to make a full facet of God's face. And I think I'm just in awe of, of that, because that's like a direct antithesis to competition that we face as women and um i'm just in awe of like the lord granting me with this like small experience to be able to see the giftedness of another that's different and just fully celebrate that and see god in a way that i wouldn't be able to see in any other case it was really cool thank you for sharing that And that's the beauty of fulfillment. Okay, why don't we shift for uh, a few more. What was it like to tell your fulfillment story, share your fulfillment story? We have one in the back. Back there, thank you. Yeah, I mean, for me, honestly, when you were talking about fulfillment stories, I was like, oh no, I don't think I have one. 
Um, but the, the Holy Spirit was like giving me um, just some really good, good guidance and prompting. And I, I realized just, some, just more about me, like and what was satisfying for me with my fulfillment story. Am I supposed to share it or just talk about it? You can if you'd like. That's up to you. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, my um, fulfillment story was I spent six or seven months volunteering weekly at a domestic violence shelter. And I found that especially fulfilling and healing given my own experience with domestic violence in college um, and just the freedom that I found from leaving and building a new life and like allowing Christ to redeem and restore that and offer forgiveness. And so what I did was really connect with women leading those situations, offering hope and guidance and just reminding them of their inherent worth and dignity, like knowing that most women will go back to those situations. It takes an average of seven times for a woman to leave a situation. So just being able to like plant the seed and offer the hope and be like, when you're ready, there is so much help and support and people cheering for you on the other side. And so I guess what I realized was most satisfying to me was like building one-on-one -on -one connections, hearing people's stories, and really just practicing that courageous compassion um, that was spoken about yesterday. Thank you. There's so much power in our fulfillment stories, even just for our own self, is to go through the exercise and think, what are my fulfillment stories and what do I find in them? Anyone else want to share what it was like? Okay, we have down here in the front and the back. So we'll go to the back first, sister, or to the front? We'll go to the back. Back, front. <laughs> we'll go in that order. I have the advantage of seeing the entire room. Oh, it's over here. Hi. Um, I, when you were told to do the fulfillment story and share it with um, the person next to us, at first, when you went through the fulfillment story, I was like, oh, I'm just going to write the first thing that comes to mind. And... In a way, I was like, oh, this is a little silly, but like it did bring me fulfillment because like I was really inspired about what you said about your grandparents. I thought that was so beautiful because I also have a really close relationship with my grandparents and I thought about the people in my life that I love very dearly. And <clears throat> when I went through it and I was gonna share it with my partner, she actually um, just stepped out. But when I shared it with her, I was like, I just wanna preface, it might sound silly, but I actually, really am glad that I shared that with her because then it again like was one of those things that like brought sincere like joy and like appreciation for it that I never like thought I could have and um so I'll just share like a little bit of it so the thing that I preface with when I told her was that I really really love physical affection I love giving hugs and like holding people all my friends and like people that I'm especially close with, like I'm always touching somebody or holding somebody. It's just like, I have to. Like when I see all the babies, I'm like, I wanna steal your child. I just wanna <laughs> hold them. And especially with people I'm close with. So the one I was talking about specifically was for um, my boyfriend. Um, so the title was like, my sunshine. We call each other sunshine. Like my sunshine loves hugs. And like, that's the way I know like that I can share that with my boyfriend, like I hold him, hold his hand and like love him in that way. And that brings me such a sense of such, so it's like this deep, like almost like, I, I just don't have to say anything. And I know that like, it'll be something that I can share with somebody. Even like, like when people are in pain, like I just need to hold them. Like I just can't not help myself. Um, or even like joy or happiness, whatever that is. But, and at first I definitely thought it was a little silly, but then I was thinking about the fact is like, I've always been that way since I was very young. Like there's always pictures of me holding my brothers, holding my parents, like, like bear hug, like on top of them. Like I can't let go of them. Um, and even talking about it now is like really like affirming that, like I think in me and like knowing that that's a thing that, um, I can share like with my friends and my family and that it is a fulfillment even if it doesn't have to be this like huge profound um, thing like in a way um, but it's something that I know like I'm good at and I can share with like people really close to me. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> and the thing that gets revealed in all of these stories is what God gave you. He want, it is a woman's unique gift out to the world is how she loves. So that's an example of how you love, 
right? And we all have that. And it's evident in every single story. So for your story in the, um, in the domestic abuse space, sister, for your story in the school, your story in terms of the physical contact, it's how you love people. This is what God wants us to do because we all do it very differently. So there's one more here, I think, yes. Um, I just wanted to share, um, it's funny that you say that you made the connection with the love because um, I love through music and I, I love, I've always done that since I was a little girl. And so mine was prompted, I loved your story about your grandparents because that reminded me of kind of the origins of my expression of love with music. And it made me think of what father said yesterday about digging into the heart of the little girl mm -hmm. inside of you. And so I just kind of was taken back to this place of when I was, you know, seven or eight years old and my sisters and I, um, my, my subject or title was the impromptu performance series because after dinner every night or whether we were at our grandparents or at um, any house really, uh, my sisters and I would perform after dinner, whether it was a play we wrote, whether it was a song, whether it was anything. And w that was how we could show love to our family. Mm -hmm. And I just look at how much that joy has inspired me in my music career and, and everything that I've done with that. And um, it really made me very joyful to tell that story, but to go back to the heart of the little girl that's inside of me. Right. So, thank, thank you, you so much for sharing that. See, each and every one of us has a unique way to love. Anyone else would probably take one more if someone, okay, we have one in the top middle row. So we'll take one more. <laughs> Which sister can get there first? Thank you. Um, I want to share about my fulfillment story, but I also kind of want to ask a question. Um, so something that I was noticing as I was trying to think about my fulfillment story and as I landed on one was how, at least for me personally, so much of my own brokenness and my own suffering is like really intertwined with each of the stories that was coming up for me. For example, the one that I landed on um, happened, it was at work and it, was, it happened while I was in the midst of like pretty severe burnout. And that was something that was interwoven in the fulfillment and the joy that, that came through that. So I guess my question, if you wanna answer it now or you can talk about it later, but um, is like what role does our own brokenness play in discovering our gifts? Because I think sometimes when I think about those fulfillment stories, um, questions about like my own goodness come up with that as well. Like if I'm trying to um, discover what my givenness is, mm -hmm. then that other side always is kind yeah. of there. So. I actually think our brokenness can very much be woven into those. Because sometimes, you know, to go back and find, it's li literally what Sister Josephine said this morning is to find the weakness and the brokenness because they too are our gifts. So for you to discover that your brokenness or your woundedness is woven into your fulfillment stories. Like if, if you're finding a fulfillment story that blossoms out of that, something that you were able to do as a result of, right? And that you did something as a result of your woundedness or brokenness that then ultimately you found satisfying, deeply satisfying that you did as a result of it. Then it fits as a fulfillment story. And God has revealed that to you, is to find that in there, right? And so none of us, you know, certainly live perfect lives. Uh, but in order to find those moments of joy and to understand, even in brokenness, God is looking for you to respond to this unique personal way of fulfillment that he gave you. So if yours comes out of that, and then you found something deeply satisfying as a result, I think it links perfectly, too, to what Sister Josephine talked about this morning. But I'm totally around at lunchtime, too, if people want to chat about this. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you so much for the gift of sharing with each other. And again, I think um, it was on one of the earlier slides, but I really think the, the fulfillment stories can help to create a culture of calling within our communities, wherever it is that we're called into our personal vocations on a day-to-day -day basis. Like, I love these stories. 
um, that people are willing to share. I certainly don't mind sharing mine. You know, most I, a lot of times I share about my grandparents. I don't usually get all choked up doing it, so I'm not really sure what the Holy Spirit was about there. <laughs> so as we roll towards the close, I want to talk a little bit around, we talk about personal vocation, call to holiness, state in life, and then where is God calling me today? So we could go to the next. This is Josh Miller, for those of you who haven't met him yet. That's a picture of Kara, who's on my slides now, and me. I clearly need a new headshot because my hair is not that long anymore. <laughs> but this is in my day to day, living my personal vocation in the day to day. Am I answering my call to holiness? Am I praying? Am I cooperating with God? Am I a gift? Right? He's given me gifts. Am I a gift out to the world? What am I doing? And this is the giftedness of Josh, of Kara, and me. It's our personal vocations woven together, contributing to the kingdom, contributing to the mystical body. And then this next one. So this is a group of our priests uh, who went so... They would be like, where did you, did you put a picture of us up on a slide? So please don't tell them. <laughs> um, so this is the group from last year who had gone through it. We had pulled them all together. And so who do I desire to serve? I really desire to serve the clergy and the lady, right? I'm responsible for both. So we piloted it this first with the clergy. We're going to bring it to the lady. One of the pastors that was in this group he brought the entire experience back. Now, he was probably one of the more resistant, you know, at the beginning. He brought the entire experience back for his staff, his staff of nine, and his 10-member lay volunteer leadership team. He loved it that much. There's really, you talk about holy fire, you know, about using your gifts. There's some amazing things that are beginning to take place in that parish. So in my service to them, you know, you look at the impact that we're able to have by bringing our own unique set of gifts. And I would be remiss if I did not talk about my, my husband, Joe. So my state in life is to marriage. And so what is my primary responsibility? Is to make sure that that man makes it to heaven. His job is to make sure I get there too. You know, so in how do I bring my gifts? How am I a gift to him every day? because he's a gift to me. So if this is recorded, I'm gonna make sure I show him that I said that, <laughs> right? But this is, this is my personal vocation, living in the day to day, in my work, in my life, and who I serve, right? And who I work with. And then this last piece, right? Looking at vocation and looking at feminine genius and looking at your action plans. I love your action plans. And so if you think about, we've talked about it now, your core motivations will be woven all through this, but in your action plans, your action plans, the intention of that is to activate your God-given gifts for the church and for the world. Do not be intimidated by that because the church and the world means everything you have, everything that you are, sorry, not have, everything that you are. So the questions that the action plan asks, I think are significant, right? What do you consider your life's mission? Right, so Sister Josephine said that, that's kind of like that 100,000 foot level, it would take like six months to figure that out. But it's good and it will evolve over time. If you would have asked me when I started with my company all those years ago, what was my life, life's mission? I would have had no idea. I was in a job and I was just gonna take it and see where it took me. You know, I'm a little jealous of those of you that are here now, the young women that have come to Given this year, to actually look at these questions, figure out what it is that moves and drives me, and to figure out who I want to serve. No one asked me that way back when, who did I want to serve, right? What moves you? What sets you on fire? What gives you life? What's the juicy juice? Your fulfillment stories can help you define what, what gives you life. And is there a population or group you feel drawn to serve? And then what are your gifts, including your core motivations that you'll you'll discover. Your fulfillment stories will help uncover those and then the M-code assessment will actually give you language to help you identify those. So it's a new initiative. Your action plan is something new. Um, it's, and it benefits someone else. And you had to be done inside of a year. 
thank heavens for all the mentors and volunteers and the wonderful leadership that you have here at Given. But your vocation, your personal vocation will be woven into your action plans. Your feminine genius is a place that will live in your action plan as you bring this out into the world. And I love everything that, that Given does in terms of supporting you to do that. I think it, you're going to have a remarkable year, everyone together, the mentors and the young women here. Um, and then the last piece of this I think is important. Where's my, meet Michael in the big room. There we go. So I love this line from Psalm, Psalm 33. So close your eyes just for a moment. And be in the mind of God. Feels like a hard place to get to, but be in his mind and listen to these words. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood forth. For all of eternity, he commanded that you would stand forth at this time. He has brought you forward for this time and age, for the mystical body. He has created you as a gift, and you are here. And you can set the world on fire. So in closing, these last two quotes that are on here. Again, it's from Josh and Luke's book, Unrepeatable. If you haven't taken a note to go and read Unrepeatable, please go and buy the book, Unrepeatable. Creation and calling are inseparably linked. God creates by calling. When God created, he called the universe into existence. The God who calls us is the same God who created us, and he calls us according to his design, the image of God. And we go out into the culture and into the world and into the church and into our families in his image. And we live, breathe, work, and bring our gifting into a world that mostly doesn't want his image. So this is the work that's in front of all of us. And women have a tremendous gift to give to the world. And then the last, because I love this too, Personal vocation is the fundamental call that strikes at the heart of the person, without which every other call is unintelligible. If we do not answer the call, he won't hear anything else that we think he wants us to do. We must answer our personal vocation. So in the everyday, where we live and where he needs us, I thank you. It has been an absolute privilege to be with you today.